bunch of keeners, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I am much older than you probably, but when I was in high school, I was probably similar to a lot of you. You know, I was on student council and all the sports teams and in all the clubs and a straight A student who never cheated because you're only cheating yourself, <laughs> which I still believe. But there was one thing, I, I actually don't know if I'm allowed to say this at the Science Center or if they're gonna kick me out, but um, I didn't like science. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I appreciate science, I'm glad there's science, I'm glad there's people who like science, but in particular, just chemistry, I, I didn't get it, okay? Like, am I ever gonna have to mix titanium and biochlorate? Is biochlorate even a thing? I did not memorize the elements very well. I think part of the problem was my chemistry teacher just wasn't very good, which was ironic because his name was literally Mr. Good. <laughs> but you know, he, he kind of just liked the three guys who were super good at science and paid a lot of attention to them and didn't really pay attention to you if you weren't going to be a rocket scientist. So I had to try really hard in chemistry just to maintain a B minus average, which was still a fine mark, but to me I was like, oh, it's not an A. <laughs> so this one time, I was late for class. I had volleyball practice in the morning, taking down the nets, getting changed. I was 10 minutes late for chemistry. But in that time, Mr. Good had assigned the big final project, worth 30% of our final mark. For this project, he had a list of inventions. Everyone got an invention, and you had to write an eight-page essay detailing who invented it, why, when, what are the environmental impacts, what are the social effects, etc. But in this time, everyone had picked a topic, and there was only one left for me to claim. Antifreeze. As a 16-year-old girl, I did not have particular enthusiasm for antifreeze. Um, so I went to Mr. Good and I said, Mr. Good, I'm not really interested in antifreeze. I was wondering if perhaps I could choose a topic of my own to inspire me about science. Sorry, Laura. I've been teaching chemistry for 25 years. I've been using these topics for 25 years. You're stuck with antifreeze. Okay, well, maybe I could just double up with someone else and share one of their top. Nope. You were late for class, you're doing antifreeze. Okay, well I thought maybe this will be educational. Maybe learning about antifreeze will set me on a path for my bright future. So I did what people did in the 90s, and I went to the public library. <laughs> it's a room with books in it. They had no books about antifreeze. They didn't have any VHS cassettes. They didn't have any microfilm slides. All I could find was an encyclopedia entry saying, yes, antifreeze exists. So I went to Mr. Good the next day, and I said, Mr. Good, there are no books in the library. I can't find any information on antifreeze. Can I please do something else? Nope, I've been doing the same topics for 25 years. You're doing antifreeze. So then I thought, ah. Maybe I'll use that fancy new invention, the internet. Let me just preface this. Computers in the 90s were not quite what they are today. All right, like our biggest breakthrough was we could access Encyclopedia Britannica on a CD-ROM. <laughs> we didn't have Google as a website or as a verb. We had other search engines like Ask Jeeves, which was a picture of a cartoon butler and you'd ask him something like, is biochlorate a real thing? And Jeeves would go and retrieve your answers for you, such as, no results found. <laughs> so I went home and I typed in, how do you make antifreeze? Jeeves didn't bring me much. Um, to be fair, there were only like 10 websites back then. But uh, all he found was stuff saying, buy our antifreeze, it is the best, but nothing really about, you know, the chemical makeup of it or the history. So in desperation, I went to Canadian Tire, and I looked at every bottle of antifreeze, reading the ingredients and the nutritional information and seeing if there was anything that could enlighten me. There wasn't. By the way, not nutritious. Um, <laughs> so I went to the automotive section, and I asked a mechanic, Excuse me, sir, do you know anything about the history of antifreeze or the chemical compounds involved in making it? Kid, I just work here. 
So the point is, I was trying really hard, okay? So I went to Mr. Good, and I said, Mr. Good, I have looked at all my CD-ROMs. I have talked to a Mastercraft technician. I have looked at both websites on the internet. Please, like, can I just pick something else? Sorry, Laura, if you can't find any information on Andy Freeze, I guess you're just not going to get a very good mark. So I went home. The assignment was due the next day. I sat in my computer chair looking at a blank word perfect document. And I thought, Laura, all your life you've been a straight A student. This time, you're going to fail. You're going to fail something. You're going to have to walk in and t walk up to your teacher and say, I'm sorry, I couldn't find any information on antifreeze. I will graciously accept a zero. Then I thought, if I'm going to get a zero anyway, why don't I just guess at everything? So I guessed at everything about antifreeze. I guessed at the name of the guy who invented it. I guessed that it was invented in 1954 because a guy's windshield froze over and he thought there's got to be a better way. I found random charts on the internet with just boxes and circles and arrows and I said, yeah, that's how you make antifreeze. I had an entire page about how antifreeze can leak out of your car onto your driveway and a cat can lick it and the cat can get sick. And then I just put clip art of cats to <laughs> try and take up space on this page. I increased the margins, I increased the line spacing, I upped the font size by half a point just to try and make this garbage span eight pages. And then on the cover I wrote, how do you make antifreeze? Take away her blanket. So I handed it in on no sleep, and I went back and sat on my lab stool, and then I thought, wait a second. I just handed in eight pages of lies. Isn't that worse than not handing anything in? Isn't that kind of on par with plagiarism? I am trying to trick my teacher. Could I get expelled for this? Oh, I'm going to get expelled for this. And I started freaking out. Every day, I would go into class thinking this would be the day where Mr. Good would expose me. One day, I was sitting on the edge of my lab stool, and he came up and said, Laura, I need to speak to you after class. OK. So I went after class. I said, hi, Mr. Good, you wanted to talk to me? <laughs> yes. I have here a lab without a name on it. Is it yours? Nope, and just ran. It was kind of like that telltale heart Edgar Allan Poe thing. <laughs> so finally the day came, and he walked in with a stack of papers and said, I have your assignments to hand back. Now, I've been teaching this class for 25 years, and I am not impressed with this group of assignments. So he handed them all back, and he handed me mine. And I thought, you know what, Laura? Maybe the real lesson here is learning how to fail. Are you ever going to need to know how to make antifreeze in your life? Probably not. Are you ever going to need to know how to fail? Probably. So maybe this is what this is all about. Maybe the mark isn't important. Maybe it's about failing. And that is the lesson you're going to learn. I'm OK with this. So I turned to the back of my assignment. And I got 88%. <laughs> so either I am a very good guesser, or my teacher doesn't really know science. And <laughs> you might be thinking that I was like, ha ha, I got you, I win. But no, I was actually kind of mad. I was like, excuse me, sir, your job is to teach me science. And you just gave me 88% for a pile of garbage? I mean, what else have I been doing that I've been rewarded for incorrectly? You've been teaching this for 25 years and you don't know the answers? And it was that moment that my blind faith in my teachers was shattered. And I realized maybe it's not that I'm terrible at science. Maybe I just don't have the best teacher. So you know, there were other topics in school that I thought were very boring. I thought the most riveting thing about geography was choosing which pencil crayon to use to color in Saskatchewan on the map. 
was usually pink. Um, and history. Oh, I thought it was so boring. Maybe because our textbooks were from the 60s and had a whole chapter on Canada's new flag. But after I was done school, I realized I knew nothing about the world because I just wasn't interested in sitting in the classroom hearing people talk about it. So I took a bus trip across Canada and I discovered that Saskatchewan is not pink. It's more of a yellowy brown. After that, after university, I moved to Europe and I've traveled through so many countries and seeing how people live day to day is something you could never learn sitting in a classroom. History and geography were two subjects I found so boring and now I love them. To be fair, still hate chemistry. All right, I, Science Center is super cool. I know you're listening. Um, but I mean, really, I'm just not interested in the elements unless I'm using aluminum to wrap up delicious pizza. So I'm sorry this is not an inspirational science story. I'm sure we will have other speakers who will inspire you scientifically. The point of all this is that I learned not to judge something based on one person's efforts to teach me. And I realized that I can always find ways to teach myself. I never learned comedy in school, but after I took classes at Second City, I just started getting up on stages and doing stuff. I surrounded myself with comedians, and I've had the chance to do festivals, stand up, improv, sketch, MC, TEDx, youth talks, because I just threw myself into something and learned by doing it. And I think that after you're finished school, if you're not yet, um, you'll find that it's very freeing being able to learn in ways that you want to. Maybe there are things that aren't interesting to you now. Maybe they just aren't interesting. Or maybe they're being taught to you in ways that just don't work for you. So I think that not failing that science project was a really important lesson to me because it taught me that marks aren't really what matter. It's what's in your head and what ignites your passion to learn that's important. And just by being here today, you're showing that you're already doing that. So like, why am I telling you all of this? <laughs> Welcome to TEDx Youth Toronto. <laughs> This year's theme is Ignite. So it's like all the passion and all the potential you have is little kindling inside of you. And it's just, after you hear these talks, it's just gonna set itself on fire. <laughs> Not actual fire, that would be unhealthy. If at any point during the day there is an actual fire inside of you, please call an ambulance. Um, but before, before we get started, we have a lot of sponsors who made this day possible, and we really do need to thank them and want to thank them. And although, you know, we would like to give them a 10-minute standing ovation each that they rightfully deserve, due to time constraints, I'm going to read out the names, and after I read a name, maybe just give them a yeah. All right? OK. So thank you to these sponsors, our initiator sponsors, Catalyst. Lakes Environmental, Woo! Shopify, Woo! Wattpad, Woo! Pizza Pizza. Woo! Our leader sponsors are Kudo Woo! and Yellow Pages. Woo! And our partners are Ontario Science Center Woo! and FVC Media. Woo! <laughs> and if you look, if you look at your name badge, you actually will see a sponsor who made it possible for you to be here today. So make sure you thank them on the old Twitter or whatnot during the breaks because they let you come here for free. So are you ready to get inspired by our speakers? <laughs> <laughs> 